slide show? What is going on under your shoulder? The little dog has something going on under his shoulder. I don't know what it is, like that. Anyway. Hi, guys. Well, it is a pleasantly cool Friday morning here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here on Friday, March 27th, 2020 in the isolation chamber of Garfield, Texas today uh, where maybe we will not hit the 90s for the first time this week. Uh, oh yes, my name is Sam Mitchell. This is my little co-pilot Sancho Panza and just to make sure you guys understand this is the coronavirus chronicles this is the latest chapter of the coronavirus chronicles if you are sick of news about the coronavirus you need to turn this video off and go check out the video uh, from collapse chronicles uh, just so I need to start training you guys. There's going to be two videos a day. The Coronavirus Chronicles, Collapse Chronicles. This is the Coronavirus Chronicles, where what I do is, uh, what I'm trying to do with the Coronavirus Chronicles is look at what is going on on this planet today, regardless of your opinions uh, about all of this, all of these pointless debates uh, that seem to be uh, taking up 99% of media space. Uh, what I am looking at is what the coronavirus, what I call the corona panic, <coughs> the panic arising from coronavirus and the economic effects from that panic are saying about uh, you know global industrial society and the collapse thereof so I want to thank my lieutenant Jay from Brazil my right hand man here at uh, coronavirus chronicles for sending me this story <clears throat> from this fellow I've been trying to get on the show, but I can't get past his agent, a fellow, an author, and I guess I would call him a futurist, his fellow Yuval Noah Harari. Yuval Noah Harari, who's written several excellent books, uh, you know, trying to figure out what the future of the 21st century uh, could look like, and this is Yuval's peek into the world after coronavirus, which is really what we're looking at on the Coronavirus Chronicles, is the world after coronavirus. And this is a long essay, guys. I encourage you to shut me up. I'm going to put the link on here. You can read it yourself, but if you just want to and we'll sit down and listen to some old collapsitarian and read it for you. I'll be happy to do that because I have nothing else to do with my life. Okay, take it away, you Val Noah Harari, and tell us about your vision of the world after coronavirus. This storm, this storm, will pass, but the choices we make now could change our lives for years to come. <clears throat> yep. Humankind is now facing a global crisis, perhaps the biggest crisis of our generation. The decisions people and governments take in the next few weeks will probably shape the world for years to come. They will shape not just our healthcare systems, but also our economy, politics, and culture. We must act quickly and decisively. We should also take into account the long-term consequences of our actions. Our actions today, what are the long-term consequences? of the way we are choosing 
to uh, to respond to this pandemic, you know, from a place of panic. Okay. When choosing between alternatives, we should ask ourselves not only how to overcome this immediate threat, but also what kind of world we will inhabit once the storm passes. Yes, the storm will pass, humankind will survive, and most of us will still be alive. But we will inhabit a different world. Many short-term emergency measures will become a fixture of life. That is the nature of emergencies. They fast forward historical processes. Decisions that in normal times could take years of deliberation are passed in a matter of hours. Immature and even dangerous technologies are pressed into service because the risks of doing nothing are bigger. Uh, well, I, again, uh, we will find out uh, what happens when every what happens when everybody works from home and communicates only at a distance what happens when entire schools and universities go online in normal times governments businesses and educational boards would never agree to conduct such experiments but these are not normal times in this time of crisis we face two particularly important choices. The first is between totalitarian surveillance, can you say the police state, and citizen empowerment. The second is between nationalist isolation and global solidarity. So uh, take a wild guess which uh, I am predicting will turn out, we are turning into a global totalitarian surveillance state divided up between all of these nationalist uh, individual governments. It's the worst possible combination. There is no doubt in my mind <coughs> that this is not my uh, rant, this is Yuval. So what does Yuval, what does Yuval have to say about under the skin surveillance? In order to stop this epidemic, entire populations need to comply with certain guidelines. There are two main ways of achieving this. One method is for the government to monitor people and punish those who break the rules. Today, for the first time in human history, technology makes it possible to monitor everyone all the time. 50 years ago, the KGB could not follow 240 million Soviet citizens 24 hours a day, nor could the KGB hope to effectively process all the information gathered. The KGB relied on human agents and analysts, and it just could not place a human agent to follow every citizen. But now, governments can rely on ubiquitous sensors and powerful algorithms instead of flesh and blood spooks. And of course, when he, you know, when he says KGB, he means all the rest of them. He means the FBI, the CIA, Department of Homeland Security, Scotland Yard, uh, whatever the Chinese version of this is. Uh, <clears throat> okay. In their battle against the coronavirus epidemic, several governments have already deployed the new surveillance tools. The most notable case is China. By closely monitoring people's smartphones, 
making use of hundreds of millions of face recognizing cameras and obliging people to God damn it. obliging people to check and report their body temperature and medical condition the chinese authorities can not only quickly identify suspected coronavirus carriers but also track their movements and identify anyone they come into contact with. A range of mobile apps warn citizens about their proximity to infected patients. This kind of technology is not limited to East Asia. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel recently authorized the Israeli security agency to deploy surveillance technology normally reserved for battling terrorists to track coronavirus patients. When the relevant parliamentary subcommittee refused to authorize the measure, Netanyahu rammed it through with an emergency decree. You might argue that there is nothing new about all this. In recent years, both governments and corporations have been using ever more sophisticated technologies to track, monitor, and manipulate people. Yet, if we are not careful, this epidemic might nevertheless mark an important watershed in the history of surveillance, not only because it might normalize the development of mass surveillance tools in countries that have so far rejected them, but even more so because it signifies a dramatic transition from over the skin to under the skin surveillance. Hitherto, when your finger touched the screen of your smartphone and clicked on a link, the government wanted to know exactly what your finger was clicking on. But with coronavirus, the focus of interest shifts. Now the government wants to know the temperature of your finger and the blood pressure under its skin which leads us to the emergency pudding. The emergency pudding. <clears throat> One of the problems we face in working out where we stand on surveillance is that none of us knows exactly how we are being surveilled and what the coming years might bring. Surveillance technology is developing at breakneck speed in what seemed science fiction 10 years ago is today old news. As a thought experiment, consider a hypothetical government that demands that every citizen wears a biometric bracelet that monitors body temperature and heart rate 24 hours a day. The resulting data is hoarded and analyzed by government algorithms the algorithms will know that you are sick even before you know it, and they will also know where you have been and who you have met. The chains of infection could be drastically shortened, shortened and even cut altogether. Such a system could arguably stop the epidemic in its tracks within days. Sounds wonderful, right? The downside of this is, of course, that this would give legitimacy to a terrifying new surveillance system. If you know, for example, that I clicked on a Fox News link rather than a CNN link, that can teach you something about my political views and perhaps even my personality. But if you can monitor what happens to my body temperature, blood pressure, and heart rate as I watch the video clip, you can learn what makes me laugh, makes me cry, 
and what makes me really, really angry. It is crucial to remember that anger, joy, boredom, can you say self-isolation, boredom and love are biological phenomena just like fever and a cough. <coughs> the same technology that identifies coughs could also identify laughs. If corporations and governments start harvesting our biometric data en masse, they can get to know us far better than we know ourselves, and they can then not just predict our feelings, but also manipulate our feelings and sell us anything they want, be it a product or a politician. Biometric monitoring would make Cambridge Analytica's data hacking tactics look like something from the Stone Age. Imagine North Korea in 2030 when every citizen has to wear a biometric bracelet 24 hours a day. If you listen to a speech by the great leader and the bracelet picks up the telltale signs of anger, you are done for. You could, of course, make the case for biometric surveillance as a temporary measure taken during a state of emergency. It would go away once the emergency is over. But temporary measures, can you say the United States income tax, for instance, but temporary measures have a nasty habit of outlasting emergencies, especially as there is always a new emergency working on the horizon, which is a hell of a lot more true uh, today than it ever was. Uh, if, if you think this coronavirus is an emergency, wait till a real emergency comes and everything that this man is saying here is going to ramp up on steroids. The police state, the surveillance state, the threat to your every, every one of your uh, rights is, uh, is directly under threat. The fascists are, are having a field day with corona panic. My home country of Israel, for example, declared a state of emergency during its 1948 War of Independence, which justified a range of temporary measures from press censorship and land confiscation to special regulations for making pudding I kid you not, the War of Independence has long been won, but Israel never declared the emergency over. It has failed to abolish many of the temporary measures of 1948. The emergency pudding decree was mercifully abolished in the year 2011. Even when infections from coronavirus are down to zero, some data-hungry governments could argue they needed to keep the biometric surveillance systems in place because they fear a second wave of coronavirus or because there is some new Ebola strain evolving in Central Africa or because you get the picture. A big battle has been raging in recent years over our privacy. The coronavirus crisis could be the battle's tipping point. For when people are given a choice between privacy and health, they will usually choose health. Yeah, like 99.9% .9 of the time is usually. Which brings us to the SOAP police. Asking people to choose between privacy and health. 
and what I how I would say this is asking people to choose between handing over their civil rights to the police state and health is in fact the very root of the problem because this is a false choice. We can and should enjoy both privacy and health. We can choose to protect our health and stop the coronavirus epidemic by not instituting totalitarian surveillance regimes, but rather by empowering citizens. In recent weeks, some of the most successful efforts to contain the coronavirus epidemic were orchestrated by South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore. While these countries have made use, have made some use of tracking applications, they have relied far more on extensive testing, on honest reporting, and on the willing cooperation of a well-informed public. Centralized monitoring and harsh punishments are not the only way to make people comply with beneficial guidelines. When people are told the scientific facts and when people trust public authorities to tell them these facts, citizens can do the right thing even without Big Brother watching over their shoulders. A self-motivated and well-informed population is usually far more powerful and effective than a policed, ignorant population. Consider, for example, washing your hands with soap. This has been one of the greatest advances ever in human hygiene. This simple action saves millions of lives every year. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, guys, I see uh, this. Uh, anyway, guys, I don't know how far I am in this. And uh, let me, and this is just the first half. So let me skip down to the last paragraph of part one of this book length essay to wrap up. And you have to go on and read this for yourself. The coronavirus epidemic is a major test of citizenship. In the days ahead, each one of us should choose to trust scientific data and healthcare experts over unfounded conspiracy theories and self-serving politicians. <coughs> if we fail to make the right choice, we might find ourselves signing away our most precious freedoms thinking that this is the only way to safeguard our health. And anyway, guys, and so then he, in the whole second half of this, I'm, I'm only halfway through this, uh, he goes through and, and breaks down uh, about the, the nationalist, you know, I, I, I had a, my uh, video yesterday of this, you know, talking about how individual nations are hoarding food and closing borders, hoarding food, you are going to see a major rise. And it's not just nationalism. The other story <clears throat> that I was had in mind to read today, which I'll hold off to tomorrow, is what we're seeing in the state of New York. And not <clears throat> And, and, and not even just the state of New York, uh, you know, going, you know, telling people from other states don't come to New York. It's the people in upstate New York uh, making it clear that people from New York City are not welcome in, in upstate New York. Uh, how upstate New York, which of course is where I was planning to move this summer, is uh, just letting, is serving notice to people 
uh, from outside of New York and even people from New York City stay the hell out of upstate New York. Uh, and, you know, trying to keep Mad Max. But that's another video for another day. But I really encourage you to go on this link and, uh, and read the rest of this. So who is this fellow who uh, I need to get on the show? Probably uh, his agent, uh, you know, wants to know how much I'm going to pay the man. So who is... Oh, it doesn't identify him. He's got a Yusef. Uh, okay, Yusef Noah Harari is author of *Sapiens*, *Homo Dose*, and *21 Lessons for the 21st Century*. Uh, anyway. We will see if we can get him on the show. So if you enjoyed uh, what Yousef uh, had to say, please take a few minutes to upload this video. And while you're over here on the coronavirus slash coronavirus chronicles slash uh, I can't remember the name of my channel, Collapse Chronicles, please subscribe. And I'm going to wrap this up and I'm going to come back at you with the Collapse Chronicles version uh, where we, you know, it's Friday, so I'm going to head over to Manga Bay looking at their laundry list of stories uh, about how this planet is collapsing all around us this week uh, while nobody, nobody is looking uh, at the way this planet is collapsing uh, that has nothing to do with coronavirus. But for the few people who are interested in that, come over to that video coming up next. Bye, guys.